A single zebra mussel looks pretty harmless, but in large groups they can pose an enormous threat to aquatic ecosystems, as well as to facilities that use large amounts of water, like power plants, municipal water facilities, and industrial water users. To begin to get a clear picture of how to deal with zebra mussels, it's important to understand how they live, grow, and reproduce. The zebra mussel is a filter feeder, similar to clams and oysters, that lives in freshwater lakes and river systems. Its common name comes from the distinctive striped patterns on its shell. However, its scientific name, Dracaena polymorpha, reflects the wide variation in colors and patterns found on zebra mussel shells. Unlike saltwater clams and oysters, zebra mussels can't live in the ocean. They're only found in freshwater habitats, and occasionally, the brackish waters of coastal estuaries and tidal rivers. Originally native to Europe, the zebra mussel was first discovered in North America in Lake St. Clair, near Detroit, Michigan, in the summer of 1988. It's likely that the mussel was introduced when a transcontinental ship dumped ballast water that carried mussels or their larvae. Since its introduction into the Great Lakes, it has spread through North America's extensive network of inland canals and rivers. Now many inland lakes have also become host to the zebra mussel. The kind of problems that industrial water users have with zebra mussels basically come into two categories. Some of them are concerned with the external structures, such as intakes, particularly when they have very small intakes. And the other problem is with internal piping, and that's particularly true for um, industries like the power industry or the auto parts industry or even the steelmaking industry. In a very short period of time, they've caused significant damage to clam populations in Lake Erie and now in the Mississippi River system and other areas, uh, other inland waters. Uh, zebra mussels filter small uh, organisms, plankton, both zooplankton and phytoplankton, out of the water column. That means two things. They rob other planktivorous fish, other fish that need those animals for food. Uh, they, they rob them of their available food. They compete successfully with planktivorous fish. Uh, more visible to your average fisherman or human being is that by taking those materials out of the water column, they're clearing up the water column. And in the last five or six years, we've seen a significant increase in water clarity in the Great Lakes. Zebra mussels are highly adaptable and can attach to virtually any hard substrate by way of a special gland which secretes a sticky substance called bissel threads. The mussels have also recently been discovered colonizing soft, muddy lake and river bottoms. Um, even soft sediments can support zebra mussels if they have sort of seed populations, to say a, a leaf, a chewing gum wrapper, a, an, an old dead shell, and, they're, and um, they're finding a lot of soft sediment populations even in Lake Erie where you're getting substantial mats of zebra mussels growing on, on essentially muck in the bottom of the lake, basically because again they're able to grow on top of each other, accumulating year after year. Thick encrusting layers of zebra mussels can contain up to 70,000 mussels per square meter. Getting rid of such encrustations can be tedious and expensive. At Ontario Hydro, we saw the first ingress of zebra mussels into our Nanticoke facility in the fall of 1989. And it was pretty well at the very beginning of the fouling cycle. It was, they only arrived in 86. So there wasn't that much known. And um, we were caught um, just a little too soon uh, for our chlorination systems having been quite finished and we got zebra mussels settling throughout our power plant. The greatest environmental effect the mussel can have on ecosystems is on the food webs as they compete with other species for food. A net effect of zebra mussels on the food web in the Great Lakes um, is illustrated by the fact that zebra mussels take living organisms that are suspended in the water column that would have been food for fish in the water column consume it and deposit it either as feces or wastefully as pseudofeces on the bottom as an organic layer that's now being utilized by uh, snails and invertebrates and bottom feeding fish. The reasons why the zebra mussels have been able to become such a serious pest are related to its biology and life cycle. In zebra mussels, the sexes are separate. They become sexually mature when they're about one year old. Spawning usually occurs in late May or early June and can continue through summer, ending in August. Gamete, egg, and sperm production starts when the water temperature warms to about 54 degrees Fahrenheit. During the spawning season, a female may release as many as one million eggs and a male, 300 million sperm. 
After expending such effort, the muscles are left in a weakened condition, and many die. The average lifespan for most zebra mussels is only about one and a half years, but a small percentage do survive to spawn a second and even a third summer. Because zebra mussels release eggs and sperm into the water, all adults must spawn at the same time. Environmental cues that aid in synchronizing spawning include water temperature, phase of the moon, and chemical release factors. Following fertilization, the embryos develop quickly and within 48 to 72 hours reach a free swimming stage known as the villager. These villagers can travel great distances in river and lake currents, as well as survive in ballast water and bait buckets. Within the next seven to 10 days, the villager develops a clam-like shell and a small extendable foot. This stage is called veliconch. The veliconch continues to grow and changes into a more muscle-like shape called a plantigrade. The plantigrade is much larger and cannot swim as well as the earlier stage. At this point, it begins to settle to the bottom, select an appropriate attachment site, and produce bissel threads. A mussel in this stage can easily detach and relocate if its first choice is not suitable. The period of plankton development is very hazardous for zebra mussel larvae. Fewer than 1% of the fertilized eggs will survive to the settling stage, and many of the juveniles will die before reaching maturity. During the three to four week plankton period, zebra mussel larvae might starve, be consumed by predators, or drift into areas that lack suitable substrates where they may settle. Even with these losses, survivors can form with very dense populations, grow rapidly, and spawn the very next summer. One natural predator in Europe is the diving duck, which can consume up to 90% of the zebra mussels in a lake or river while overwintering. Unfortunately, North American diving duck populations are relatively small, and diving ducks here don't overwinter in the Great Lakes region. Some fish native to North America do feed on zebra mussels, but they are not well adapted to this and will most likely be unable to suppress zebra mussel populations. Up to now, there have been no reports of significant parasites or diseases in North America that might serve to reduce zebra mussel populations. Humans have introduced many foreign species worldwide. In the Great Lakes, over 120 non-native aquatic plant and animal species have been identified. The pace of non-native introductions is increasing, and there have been several new species discovered since the early 1980s. Shortly after the discovery of the zebra mussel in the Great Lakes, a closely related mussel species was discovered. The quagga mussel hasn't spread as far and as quickly as the zebra mussel, but it can now be found in Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, and the St. Lawrence River. Zebra mussels and quagga mussels are similar in their ecological impacts and in their ability to colonize surfaces. They also appear very similar, but quagga mussels tend to be more rounded on their underside or on their hinge side. Quagga mussels also tend to be more tolerant of colder and deeper waters. It will take many years of research before we fully understand the long-term impacts of the zebra mussel invasion on freshwater ecosystems. It will also take at least that long before effective methods can be developed to control them. However, one thing is certain. By understanding the biology of this freshwater invader, we stand a better chance of being successful in our efforts to minimize its future impact on our lake and river ecosystems and the economies that rely on them.